Get Rich Education is brought to you by Nurata Real Estate Corporate Direct and Ridge Lending Group. Cashflow real estate investors, this is Get Rich Education's Keith Weinhold. Did you know that you can finance up to 35 income properties all with one lender? Ridge Lending Group specializes in investment property loans, and they do it in almost every U.S. state. Ridge has worked with tens of thousands of real estate investors and homeowners all over the country. They've been doing this for investors for so long that at this point, they've helped more families realize their dreams of becoming real estate investors than any other mortgage lender in the country. To find out more, visit RidgeLendingGroup.com. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else, and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. Hey, welcome to Get Rich Education. This is episode 105. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. My slack-jawed act is back on track for another wealth-building week. We need to sow seeds of prosperity because the scarcity mentality is abundant and the abundance mentality is scarce. Today, we're talking turnkey real estate investing in the Texas metros with a very bright young millennial whom is frankly a star in this business, in my opinion. This guest and I met on this year's Real Estate Guys Investor Summit at Sea Cruise in Miami. First, I've got some great news for you. Peter Zion is returning to GRE. Four weeks ago, you discovered how he was so powerful that I considered inviting him back to focus specifically on United States geography and real estate investing, and we plan to do just that. I had a number of you write in saying, yes, please, we would love to have Peter back. That show is well down the road, though. The last time Peter appeared, he actually mentioned a number of reasons why Texas is going to be an economic powerhouse. Well, it already is, but it's going to continue to be well into the future. And this is someone whom has worked for private intelligence companies, and he really knows what to anticipate for investors economically, demographically, and geopolitically. And anticipating those trends is paramount to successful investing. So it's timely to have a Texas-centric show today. The next few episodes, we have the return of Rich Dad Advisor Garrett Sutton. We've got another in-house chat here with Get Rich Education's own business developer. That's the guy with all the great ideas, John Collins. Later, we're also going to do an episode for you on whether it makes more sense for you to rent the home that you live in right now or to own that home that you live in. So that episode is going to be about you and your primary residence. And I'm going to have a lot of opinions and facts for that renting versus buying a home show. And if you think that paying rent to a landlord is like throwing money away, well, that's just not true. All right. Now, just imagine this. Imagine a company out there that would maintain and filter a property database so that they could hand select a single family income property that ends up being suitable for you to invest in down the road, okay? So what that company would do is they would fully renovate that property once they own it, and then that company would screen tenants and place a tenant in that property, and then they would manage it, and then at that point, they would sell it to you, the investor, such that you would expect cash flow from day one. So yes, that cash flowing property is already renovated, already tenanted and already under management, then they sell it to you and you cash flow immediately. Now, do you think that sounds too good to be true? All right. Is that arrangement just simply too good to be true? Well, what I just explained to you is called a turnkey real estate investing model. We've probably done, I don't know, maybe six or seven turnkey real estate investing centric episodes here. Turnkey, it basically means all done for you. Today's guest represents a Texas-based turnkey real estate investing company. Now, when it comes to an abundance mentality, we want to think about win-wins. You don't want to have to win at the expense of someone else. That makes it a win-lose, okay? And win-lose, that's really a scarcity mindset because in a business relationship, you feel like there's only enough to go around for there to be 
one winner in a deal. That's why it's a scarcity mindset. Well, I want everyone to win in a deal. If the other party wins, well, then it doesn't diminish the strength of my investing win in any way at all. So let me tell you why turnkey real estate investing is often a win-win between the investor, whom is you, and the turnkey company. Okay, that way you'll also understand why turnkey real estate investing is not too good to be true. It's often profitable for turnkey real estate investing companies to operate because a turnkey provider, they establish efficient systems for identifying a distressed property at a low price. That turnkey company has supplier and contractor relationships in a geographic market that they can employ at scale, and therefore they put less money into a property than what they sell it to us, the investor, for. I mean, of course, otherwise, why would you even be in business? So a turnkey company profits, hopefully, by selling the property to us for more than they've put into it. And I've looked at turnkey companies' profit margins on their, basically, their fix and flip to us, and it isn't always that great. Because remember, when you buy a distressed asset yourself, when you discover what's behind the walls and that something needs to be fixed, well, that's all on a property owner, and you almost always discover more that's wrong, not less. Well, that risk is on them. Hopefully, they're finding that stuff before they sell it to us. We do a home inspection report as a hedge to make sure they've found everything. So a turnkey company, they hope to profit on the fix and flip to us. And then secondly, if you select that turnkey company to provide the management, then they can also get ongoing monthly cash flow themselves. Or you can buy from a turnkey provider and have someone else manage it. And that other manager, they better be profitable as well, or else they won't be in business for very long either. Again, of course, otherwise, why operate an entire property management company? So for a turnkey company, let's think about it from their side, okay? It's both a flip from the purchase and sale, and it's kind of like a rental because they hold for management cash flow. So I think once you understand that, you understand why turnkey is not too good to be true. Effectively, the management company is fine with you having your turnkey in their management portfolio for cash flow, which, by the way, your tenant effectively subsidizes or pays anyway. You target cash flow as well, which the tenant pays through the manager and to you. And you know what? That doesn't even mean that the tenant is a loser either. It's a win for them or else they likely wouldn't live in your turnkey property. Okay, when they choose to occupy your property, there's a value proposition for that tenant. Though it's not a strictly financial one, a tenant motive or win, if you will, is that their benefit of living there equals or exceeds the monthly rent that they pay. All right, let's back up a few steps to when that turnkey property was rehabbed for you during the months before you bought it. The vinyl plank flooring guy and the window washing gal, hopefully they made a profit too, or they won't be in business for very long either. So everyone can win here. Now, I'm really concerned with you winning. As a GRE listener, I'm glad you're here, but you're not here for me. You're here for you. So let's talk about you. Turnkey real estate investing is just a really smart way for you to be a direct investor. When you're a direct investor, you potentially reap the reward of being a profiteer from real estate's five simultaneous profit centers. And by now, you can probably repeat after me and name those five. Number one is appreciation. Number two is cash flow. Number three is loan pay down made by the tenant. Number four is tax benefits. And the fifth one is inflation hedging. And at the same time, you have an asset that's relatively passive, and you are now miles ahead on a return on time invested basis. But let's sprinkle in a curb your enthusiasm minute with me here, all right? Just because a property is labeled turnkey, it doesn't mean that you can't lose. And yeah, it doesn't mean you can't lose. I don't like double negatives and I just use one, okay? That is to say that you can lose. We've talked about a home inspector report as part of your due diligence in the past. Always get one of those done. I'm sure today's guest would tell you to get one of those done. Of course you want a home inspection report, even on a freshly renovated turnkey. You would even want one on a brand new construction home. That's just a smart way for you to protect yourself. That's basically like the cheapest insurance ever. But here's a new concept for you, okay? I want you to build a quote-unquote 
I'm calling this a tenant inspection report, all right? And you're not really getting a hard copy one in a formal sense, but when you inherit a turnkey tenant, I want you to find out some things from your provider, like how long has the tenant lived in the property that you're buying? What's the tenant's payment history like? What was their payment history like in the property that they occupied before this one, if you can get that? How stable is your tenant's job? How long have they been at their job? How did things look when a court search and criminal background check were run on your tenant? Were they run on your tenant? How good is your tenant's credit report? Okay, so I want an informal, if you will, I'm calling it a tenant inspection report to be done as part of your due diligence. You're going to have a mortgage on a property that you don't intend to occupy. Mortgages are controlled by cash flows. Cash flows come from tenants. And tenant rent payments originate with jobs. So part of your abundance mentality is about win-wins. And be sure to build a de facto tenant inspection report. Turnkey Real Estate Investing has helped make a lot of ordinary people wealthy. Here at Get Rich Education, we've been out-of-state turnkey real estate investors for years ourselves. And for you, here we are in quarter four of this year. And if you haven't added as many properties to your portfolio as you would have liked, well, we get quite actionable today. Let's learn about turnkey real estate investing in Texas, where you have some of the fastest growing, most economically stable markets in the nation. Today's guest is a successful millennial entrepreneur with an emphasis in real estate and a strong construction background. Over the last two decades, he's swung the hammer. He's been a general contractor. He's directed property management. Then he secured his broker's license, and now he manages a $25 million real estate investment portfolio. Now he is the COO of American Real Estate Investments, and under his direction, they are growing really fast. They're even on pace to be one of the largest turnkey rental providers in the United States. In fact, a real estate investment magazine even awarded them the turnkey provider of the year. He has a no-nonsense and what I'll call a straightforward approach, and he's even launched his own podcast called Behind the Desk. I've listened to some episodes myself. I love his approach there. That could be another show that you should check out. He's a firm believer that knowledge is power, but passion takes precedence over all. Welcome to Get Rich Education, Carl Dean. How are you, Keith? Thanks for having me. Hey, I'm feeling pretty good. And when I'm around Carl in person, I can feel that passion. You know, you just kind of get this feeling that if there's a great deal to engage in, that Carl's going to be one of the first ones to know about it. (laughs) I could be. Carl, you're an extrovert. I'm an introvert. And I think your extroversion, it kind of really it manifests and reflects in a, a lot of ways. And, you know, speaking of being outgoing, you will move your company to where the action is. So tell us about moving from your Michigan roots to where you are now. You go with the market, right? I don't, I'm not tied to any market. I'm a, I'm a young millennial. So, you know, no kids, no wife. And for me, it's easy to move and, and kind of adjust. And, uh, I, you know, I like to travel. I like to experience new markets. I like to get a feel of different markets. I feel like it really diversifies my experience in real estate in general, right? Just being able to feel different markets and see what is going on in a market like Michigan or Kansas City, California. It's, everything is different, right? They all move. They have different factors. They have different triggers. It's really, it helps me be more well-rounded as an investor. Now, real estate is hot. It has been for a few years now. And Texas is hot with its business-friendly environment, with its tax incentives, with its incredible job growth. Is that what took you to Texas and Dallas-Fort Worth specifically? Yeah, absolutely. So like, uh, the main reason we originally moved there is because a lot of the hedge funds and publicly traded REITs were buying down there. And so I started in Michigan. We moved to Kansas City, and we kind of that's when I took over for American Real Estate Investments. And then after that, uh, we just decided to go to Texas because that was where all of our properties were being sold, and it was really the easiest asset to manage. You know, it was more of an A-class market that makes sense in Texas. You know, the taxes are a little bit higher there and whatnot, but the A-class assets perform really well, and that's what the hedge funds are buying. So I just decided to put all of our focus in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and although we do operate all throughout Texas and all the major markets, I think Dallas is a good headquarters for our company. Okay, so maybe it was somewhat of a follow the concrete, follow the big money, see where they're going and kind of leverage their research. Absolutely, because at the end of the day, you never want to get stuck with assets if you're a turnkey provider, right? That's not really my business of holding assets. I provide assets. So, you know, at the end of the day, we, we do sell to, you know, the mom and pop buyers, the 401k IRA rollovers. But I wanted to be somewhere where if all else fails, I have hedge funds that I could sell to, things like that. So I have kind of a plan B. 
That's a great way to think about it. Now, since real estate's been hot and Texas has been hot, you know, once in a while you hear people say they think that the Texas real estate market is overheating. I don't necessarily think if something's hot, it's overheating, and I sure don't in Texas's case. But what's your spin on that? I mean, you obviously went there and settled there recently for a reason, so you might not necessarily think it's overheating as well. Can you speak to that? Being in the market, seeing what's going on every day and not talking about it from afar and reading what you hear in the news or just assuming that it's overheating because there's so much growth, being there really helps you see that there is no signs of anything overheating, right? Everyone knows the triggers, but when you have like the Texas Enterprise Fund being so aggressive in scouting out new businesses, white collar jobs to come to the state and the vacancy rates are really low. We don't have any trouble at all renting our properties. We have a lot of corporate relocation. So it all depends on the jobs, right? As long as there's jobs for people, as long as there's, you know, tax programs and different things that they can do to help people be more stable in the economy, then people are going to continue to come. I mean, there's 600 to 1,000 people moving to Texas every day. I mean, there's multiple reports showing all of the growth coming from California, coming from Chicago, coming from, you know, a lot of the colder states and a lot of more expensive markets to move to Dallas and, and set up their business or just move there to work. Yeah, I really think that you've caught a wave there. Yeah. You know, looking out toward the future, what would be some visible signs that the market is topping in Texas? No different from any, any other market, right? When the vacancy rates start to get low and the new construction's still moving forward, that's kind of a, a scary thing to deal with. Obviously, interest rates, if the interest rates start to go up and people don't want to refinance homes or don't want to purchase a new home, uh, those things can definitely have triggers and signs of a market doing something like topping or you know getting to a point where you, you're not going to grow anymore. People start to get a little nervous, but you know I haven't seen any of that. Right? There's been a lot of job growth. There's been a lot of people still migrating to the the economy to the market, and so the triggers would be the same as any other market. Right? The dollar being overinflated, those type of things. But it's nothing different than any other market, really. Well, real estate's really just a vehicle. You know, behind that real estate, there is a tenant, and behind that tenant, there is a job. So, you know, let's talk about some of those business sectors that are really supportive to this growth that an out of state real estate investor can capture. Tell us about the different business sectors and what you see happening. And of course, you know, there are so many Texas metro markets, but I think we're specifically talking about three or four Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, and Houston. Tell us about the business sectors. Yes, I mean, the biggest one that I see a lot of growth in is obviously the medical sector. There's a lot of different medical jobs being brought in, you know, to Houston specifically. And I think that that helps kind of offset the dependency on oil, which is great. Other than that, I see a lot of, uh, you know, education, health, definitely a lot of IT, a lot of finance, a lot of white collar jobs, right? There's not a lot of service industry. There's still obviously a lot of trade and transport with Texas being such a big import export state. But definitely, I see a lot of white collar financial jobs, different types of education, healthcare, those type of things, which is a good sign, really. I mean, you, you want to see those things in a market that you know, so many people think it's so dependent on oil. But if you look at the, the numbers as far as how many jobs were added for medical sector last year in Houston and financial sector throughout DFW, it really kind of helps you feel a little bit more secure in the investment and in the market. Yeah, that does. Those are thriving business sectors that are more sustainable and less likely to booms and busts like an economy rather than a business sector or a commodity like oil is. And, you know, for example, Dallas, Fort Worth, there are just a slew of Fortune 500 companies there. In fact, many bill Dallas, Fort Worth as the financial capital of the South. So I think a generation ago, we would have been talking more about oil and it is a commodity sector and more likely to these boom and bust cycles. But that's just not true anymore. It's really past that. I mean, the Texas Enterprise Fund for the last since, you know, 2004, has really been super aggressive in getting these white collar jobs to come in and offset the dependency on oil, right? Offset the dependency on the energy sector and things like that. And they've done a really great job. I mean, they've spent over $600 million to incentivize major corporations and companies to come and relocate to the Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, Austin markets and help fuel the economy other than, you know, its dependency on oil. And that's, that's made a drastic impact. And even when there was the oil scare, you know, just recently down in Houston, they still brought in so many medical jobs that, you know, the economy really didn't feel it. I was there a lot of times in the market, and obviously I live in Texas. So I see like a lot of people from other states talking about, oh, it's the scare, the scare, the scare. But when you're in the market, you really don't see that, right? There's, you might have got some layoffs, but you, you really don't feel that dependency on oil like you used to. Any other thoughts about business sectors there and what's really driving the economy since that's where our income streams come from? There's a lot of Fortune 500 companies moving in. It's definitely a lot of IT, a lot of you know financial companies are, are like crazy. So we just had like Charles Schwab come in and do a regional campus, and they've agreed to invest 
significant amount of money into the economy, same as many other companies that have come there. $100 million capital investment that they've agreed to basically hire new people, you know, develop a large piece of land and all this. I mean, those Charles Schwab, those different types of company like that, like McKesson Co., these large, large Fortune 500 companies are making a very, very large impact in Texas, throughout Texas, everywhere, really. Yeah, you kind of have a migration of a lot of people from a higher cost market like California to a lower cost market like Texas. And not only are residents and citizens driven to Texas for things like business friendly tax incentives. Well, a lot of times when a company moves to Texas from California, you know, they have an ample labor supply. The cost of real estate's lower there. The cost of doing business is just generally lower there. In fact, one might be able to pay lower wages to a Texas resident than a California resident as well. So any more insight on the migration into Texas, especially from California? I was looking at an article just this morning and uh, talking about Texas transplants take $1.7 billion in adjusted gross income with them in moving to Texas. So there's just constantly people moving every single day to Texas. Texas was ranked number one nation for you know business capital investments. So of the $166 billion in capital investments made in the U.S., a third of that, more than a third actually, was in Texas. So there's definitely a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon, right, and coming to Texas and taking advantage of the tax breaks and taking advantage of the incentives and uh, really putting money into the economy. So those are good things. Yeah, and for an out-of-state investor, you have a state that's quite landlord-friendly. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, overall, it is kind of, I guess, a, a fortunate, uh, I don't know whether you call it coincidence or not, but it is the circumstance that luckily, landlord-friendly states and jurisdictions just do seem to correlate with those properties that have cash flow. Those are sort of the criteria that you have in the Midwest and the South, and then on the coasts, you don't have those things so well. But now one thing we do have as a potential headwind in Texas is that as an out-of-state investor, we typically pay higher property taxes, Aaron. When I think about property taxes, I often think of, you know, what is that annual property tax obligation based on a percent of the purchase price or value of the property? And, you know, I typically see about 3% annually with Texas properties. So you want to speak to the property tax somewhat with an out-of-state investor coming in and probably paying more property tax as a percent of value than they're used to. Yeah, I mean, I always advise everybody to, if you're buying properties in Texas, I would set up an LLC that's located in Texas. That obviously will save you a couple dollars. But for the most part, yes, Texas does have high taxes on properties. And that's, and, and it is what it is. That's why we don't deal with a lot of the B class assets that are, say, seventy five dollars to $130,000 in Texas. They just don't make as much sense because of that tax, that tax bracket, I should say. But when you get up into the assets that are $150,000, $250,000 assets, it's not such a big deal. Yes, the taxes are high, but when you look at the cash flow, when you look at the appreciation, the asset still makes sense. And it's still a safe asset. It's still a newer asset than you'll find in a lot of different markets. And, uh, you know, the cost of living is, is ideal for tenants. And so for me, trying to always be in a safe asset, because we're in multiple markets, but, you know, trying to be in a safe asset. And if I was to tell somebody, hey, if you're going to use your retirement fund and invest in this market, I would say Texas is just a safe bet. You still positively cash flow. You know, the, the taxes aren't to the point where, they're throwing off your cash flow in, in, in such a way that you have a negatively geared asset, you're still being able to cover your mortgage and make cash on top of that. And so that with the appreciation and with the market growth is definitely, I don't see the taxes as a large factor like many people do. Yeah, it just all comes down to how do the numbers work out in an APOD, an annual property operating data statement or the profit and loss. You know, if it still produces cash flow, yeah, you want to know what all of those expenses are, but you know the bottom line is, is that cash flow a positive number or not? And those property taxes are just one of those things that are factored in. Mm -hmm. Because from a classic rent income to value standpoint, rent to value ratio, you often can get those 1% there in a lot of those single family properties that you manage in Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, and Houston. So you mentioned price point a little bit, Carl. Tell us a little bit more about just what price points work and just kind of an example of how the numbers what might work on a typical turnkey property that your company offers. Yeah, so I mean, the 1% is getting harder and harder to achieve. Yeah. I talk to hedge funds every six months and they'll call me and say, hey, how are the houses looking? You know, what do you got? Send me the inventory. And they're always trying to hit that 1% mark, which again, it's just, it's becoming harder and harder to get that. But our typical assets in Texas and where I find kind of that teetering point where it really makes a lot of sense is asset that's anywhere from 140 to 250,000, whether it's a new build, whether it's, you know, an 85 build, I try not to go into the seventies really too much. I like the newer built homes because again, that's kind of what the hedge funds buy. And I always want to have that backdoor exit if I need it. So our assets will be, let's say you have an $1,800 rent, you'll have maybe a $190,000 property, 
and that'll cash flow anywhere from a six to an eight percent net. And you know, you will have the taxes and everything be reassessed each year, but at the same time, you're getting increases in rent and you're getting the appreciation. So I tell a lot of people, and this is a very common practice actually down in Texas, that we only sign one year leases because the market is growing so fast. We want to make sure that we can keep the rents where they need to be so the numbers make sense, right? So we usually do a 5% increase on the rents each year. And that helps kind of offset the taxes if they're going up because the property is increasing in value. I've increased rents more than 5% on several occasions where maybe I just didn't have good rental comps. And the next year I did, I reassess and I, you know, I'll rent for maybe a hundred dollars more, just a hundred dollars flat, right? Not even a percentage. So you got to keep up with the rent increases. I tell a lot of my investors that, and especially the foreign investors, because they're not here, they're not watching the assets. They deal a lot of times with a resident agent. And so, you know, I make sure that they tell them, make sure your resident agent is staying on top of things when it comes to reassessing your rent each year to make sure you're getting what is market value so you don't fall behind when the taxes increase. Right? You got to pay attention to those kind of things. And so the one-year leases are a really common thing for us down in Texas, and we try to stick with that. If we do sign a two-year lease, it's something where we tell them, hey, your rent will adjust to market rates entering the second year of your tenancy. Tell them that up front, and then they're not as likely to leave after year one. Yeah, exactly. I mean, ideally, you want to keep tenants, right? But you want to make sure that they know, hey, we have to keep this rent at at market rate. So typically, it's a 5% increase. And, you know, that's because these homes are owned by investors. And we want to make sure that the homes are performing as they should. And there's so much demand for property there, typically, in a lot of your markets that you you can weed out the tenants that aren't quite okay with that. Our tenants are just, they're phenomenal in Texas. I mean, you have so many corporate relocation tenants. We use like companies like OneProp and different property management companies, and they're great, right? They have a lot of corporate relocation contracts with the different companies that are moving here. And so our tenants might own homes in other markets and just be moving there for a job. And so they're like really stable tenants. So we can really handpick cream of the crop, right? Like it's not like California where you can't pick your tenant. Here we have options, right? We can look at the top five tenants for this particular property and choose which one we see as the best fit. And that's definitely, uh, obviously, a bonus, right, for us. Now, there are some markets in the United States where I would say, I don't know if you can get a 5% rent increase. I just don't know if that's sustainable. But the Texas markets, they're somewhat different. That's very believable that one could get that because you do have a durability of that income stream behind the tenant. That tenant feels like they have a durability of an income stream because they have a job often with a thriving, growing company, and they've got confidence and they might have income increases as well. And that can translate through the property to us as investors. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Our guest is American real estate investment COO, Carl Dean. More when we come back, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Garrett Sutton here, Robert Kiyosaki's asset protection attorney and the author of Loopholes of Real Estate. As an American or foreign-based investor in U.S. real estate, you know we are a litigious society. You know that you need to protect your real estate and paper asset holdings with the right mix of LLCs and corporations. My firm, Corporate Direct, not only forms these entities, but importantly, we properly maintain them too. If you fail to follow the corporate formalities, you can lose it all in an instant. Corporate Direct is your source for LLC protection and maintenance in all 50 states. Visit CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention Get Rich Education for a free bonus. Switch your resident agent service to us and receive another bonus. It's all good. We look forward to assisting you at CorporateDirect.com. Are you having a hard time finding great investment properties? Unfortunately, the best deals are rarely found locally. Successful investing begins with the right properties in the right markets. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best deals across the U.S. Our simple, proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly cash flow. Get your free copy of the ultimate guide to passive real estate investing at noradarealestate.com slash guide. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com slash guide. This is the Millionaire Minds T. Harbecker. You're listening to the powerful Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. 
Welcome back to Get Rich Education with our guest, Carl Dean. So, Carl, let's talk about the character of the turnkey properties that you offer. I mean, certainly on the low end with the price point, there's got to be a tipping point where things don't make sense. You probably get better rent-to-value ratios, but you have trouble with tenants and managing them. And then up on the higher end, you also have the scale that kind of tips and tilts towards it not being profitable for an investor anymore, even though you might be able to attract a great tenant. So let's talk about that sweet spot a bit and just what the homes look like. I'll get into like the the sweet spot a little bit first here. So when it comes to investing in Texas, a lot of people will come to our office and say, hey, I want investment properties in Plano or Frisco or, you know, one of these these higher end North Dallas markets. And it's sometimes it's hard to get their mind around the fact that these are cash flowing performing assets. Those markets simply just don't make sense. You have a house that is the exact same size and will get the exact same rent in North Dallas as it will in South Dallas, but the value of the home is 300 grand compared to 200,000. So say you got a house in an area like Grand Prairie, you'll get a 900 or $1,900 rent for that property. And uh, you'll get the same rent for a property in Plano, Texas, uh, which is North Dallas. The difference in value obviously is going to be $200,000 in Grand Prairie and $300,000 in Plano. And the, it throws off the cash flow. And on the same spectrum on the other side, uh, with the lower end properties, say you're you know talking about a property where you get maybe nine hundred or eight hundred dollars for rent, you're looking at a property that it's going to still cost you one hundred and ten, hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and you're going to also have the taxes going off that the value number. So they just don't cash flow as well. The real good area, the sweet spot, really is like the South Dallas areas. Some houses in Carrollton and Addison at times will make sense for us, and then. Anywhere around Fort Worth, really, there's a lot of growth. There's a lot of good schools over there. And so we definitely try to target those areas where the $150,000, $160,000 asset is really our sweet spot. Those are assets where, you know, the cash flow is good, the value is not too high, and they just seem to make sense. So if you're talking about a house that's $160,000, you might have a rent of fifteen fifty, And obviously, that's close enough to that 1% mark where it makes the most sense and your taxes aren't high, your value is good. That's kind of the sweet spot. That's the reason we only do the A-class assets in Texas. There really is, in my opinion, no point to have rental properties in areas like Frisco or some of these other areas because your cash flow is just going to be so minimal. It might even be negatively geared in a lot of cases. And then as far as, you know, what we look for in our properties, definitely 100%, 3-2 is the lowest we go, right? That's by far. There's no three ones in our inventory. There's no two-bedroom, two-bath. It's definitely a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house is our minimum criteria. Okay. And that's because hedge funds won't touch anything that's not at least three bedrooms, two bath. Again, we always want to have that plan B. We always want to have something that's, you know, kind of our safety net in case we had to go liquidate for any reason. And so definitely we stick with the three twos, but we go all the way up to five bedroom, five baths. I mean, we have homes that, you know, we just sold a home actually about three months ago that was five bedroom, five bath, and it was 4,000 square feet. It was in Lancaster. And the home sold for $200,000. Now, you're not going to find that in a lot of markets. And when I tell you that the home was built in 2010 and it's all brick, you know, people just can't believe that. They have a hard time getting their head around that. They're like, what do you mean? How is that even possible? You know, in a market like that, you talk about, and it's all about the sub markets, right? There's areas where home prices are very high. And, you know, right down the street, there's areas where it's more of a, you know, a more steady market where you're going to get a lot of good value for newer built homes. Granted, the schools might not be as nice, but at the same time, they're not terrible schools. You're not in areas what people would call the hood. You know, you're still in decent areas with good working communities. You know, the streets are clean. There's not a lot of crime. And that's always something I look for, right? If if I'm looking at a property, and, and this is the same with the hedge funds. If I'm comping out a property and just kind of doing my assessment or due diligence, I'm always going to look at the crime. And I do that off Trulia. I'm not going to, you know, there's no secret formula to looking up the crime other than just checking out the Trulia crime report. And that's what the hedge funds do. I mean, they tell me when I submit our inventory, make sure you have a column with the Trulia crime link, right? So it's make it easy for them. And that's obviously a big factor. You don't want to buy houses in areas where there's a lot of crime. And so Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, all these major markets in Texas have these major freeways that surround the downtown areas and everything inside those major circled freeways is kind of like more of the urban areas. And, you know, the the values are a little bit higher because they're closer to the city and there's also a higher crime. And so those don't really make so much sense for us. So we go outside those major freeways. And like I said, in every major Texas market, there's that big circle freeway around the city and everything we do tends to be outside of that. And typically it'll be east, west, or south of that because anything north 
tends to just get outside of our price point and the cash flow doesn't make sense. Yeah, so it sounds like you're not in the inner cities. And one reason is because you specialize in single family homes, you know, you're showing a greater sensitivity to things like crime and the school district. And, you know, if we have an investor that's interested in buying efficiency apartments, well, the school district, that might have very little to do with that influence on the desirability of an efficiency apartment tenant, but that can have a whole lot to do with that of a single family home tenant. And, Carl, one interesting thing that you bring up that I don't hear a lot of other providers bring up is you're talking a lot about the exit strategy. You know, you're talking about going ahead and putting skin in the game in assets where if something went wrong, you could go ahead and flip that to a hedge fund. And that liquidity, tell us about how that transfers right into the investor, because when you have an investor, they want to have an exit strategy if they would need to, and they have a willing buyer. Most of our properties that we're selling right now, because the market is so hot, I mean, we could put a lot of our properties on the retail market and probably sell higher than what we're selling cash flow properties for. And so that obviously makes me feel good. And that's always great. But we put tenants in them, right? As soon as we buy them, we put tenants in them. And so now you have a turnkey property that's cash flowing and your market that you can sell that to is a little bit more limited than just the regular retail market. And so you never want to be in a position where you feel stuck, right? And not, not to say that in Texas, you would be stuck, but it's always for me because I grew up in C-class, right? I grew up doing C-class assets, you know, $800 rents, $750 rents, and I sold to hedge funds for a lot of my life. And it comes to a point where it's a lot of stop and go, right? They're saying, oh, we want 30 properties a month. And then they all of a sudden stop and you're holding 30 or 40 C-class assets you plan to sell to them and they didn't come through or they stopped buying or whatever the case may be. And so that's just always made me very cautious. And that's the main reason that I am in Texas and I am dealing with an asset class that I know no matter what, at the end of the day, there's enough buyers out here in the market, whether it be hedge funds or different companies that will take these assets off my hands if I needed that. Gosh, that is such a smart thing to say, Carl. And I hear very few providers talk about that. As investors, we want to begin with the end in mind. We, we want to feel pretty good about our exit strategy before we even go into something. Yeah. Because part of this is I know, because I live in a high-priced property market myself, I know it's very tempting for a California or New York or New Jersey resident to see a $150,000 brick home in Dallas and almost think, I don't even care if it's tenanted right now. I don't even know what the sub-market's like. I don't even know if we can keep it rented. I just know that it's cheap and it looks beautiful, so I want that. But that's not the right approach. A company like you goes ahead and filters that out for people, and you really offer a great, valuable service. Yeah, and that's the thing. You know, a, a lot of people, they, especially foreign buyers, because they're just not from here. Or, and, you know, Californians are almost just as bad because things are so different in California. They see these properties for $150,000, and they look at what, what it could rent for and all these different things, and they don't even care what kind of condition it's in. They're just like, that's a great asset, and they just jump the gun too quick. It's a really tricky situation when you get yourself into a bad asset and you have a company who maybe sells you the asset and then is gone. You have to go find a property manager. You have to find a rehab team. We really try to focus on making sure all of those things are covered for our clients, making sure that the property management is in place, which we've taken in-house a lot of times now, making sure that the tenant is there, the tenant is qualified. We try to make it a completely seamless and effortless process for the investor. They just want to put money somewhere and own an asset without having to deal with the headache of the contractors and, and the repairs and all those other things. So we try to provide a full turnkey service across the board. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people who have great deals, but you're stuck having to deal with the contractors and trying to figure out those things. And, and when you're in a different market investing in Texas, say you're in California investing in Texas, it can be hard to find good contractors that you can count on and rely on to do things. And so we really try to just take care of all those things for the investor, nip everything in the butt on the front end, and just provide a full turnkey product. Tell us a bit more about tenant quality. How do you find the right tenants? When American Real Estate Investments goes ahead and takes control of a property, when you take control of that property, is it already tenanted or how do you go about finding tenants? Everything we do, we buy either tax auction or wherever, but we do our own rehabs and we place our own tenants. So we definitely have multiple people who will send us tenants, different tenanting agencies and whatnot will send us tenants. Uh, and we we have a, a team that filters through those and, you know, does the background checks and the screening and all that stuff. When you're talking about passive income, there's a fine line between passive income and, and a high return, right? And I never chase a high return because the higher the return, the more risk there's involved. When you're talking about a tenant in Texas, my minimum rent is $1,200. I just find that that's the best quality tenant. When I get underneath that rent amount, 
I have a lot more issues when you run the numbers over you know, a two-year period, say over 50 properties. You have a lot more issues with vacancies or people not paying their rents or having to do an eviction and people with less than steady situations. And so $1,200 minimum rents are definitely like my cutoff. I don't want the headache of dealing with Section 8 or, or dealing with troublesome tenants or, or troublesome areas at all. I try to just stay in that passive realm of $1,200 minimum rents purchase it, put a tenant in it, and it's cash flowing, right? So when I sell to the investor, I can sleep at night knowing that that's a good asset with a quality tenant that's been screened, and they're going to have passive income. There's not a lot of ways in real estate to get passive income when you're dealing with high-risk assets, when you're dealing with forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 assets, unless you have an outstanding management team, like we all know that there are some out there in multiple different markets. But it takes a lot on the ground for someone to have your back, to have your best interests in mind. With the Texas houses, the reason we've taken on management in the last year and started growing that management company is because they're so easy to manage. It's not like some of our other markets where it's a little bit more hands-on. We prefer the management company to be the management company because that's their full-time focus. In Texas, it's like we don't really have issues. Everything in the home is replaced. You know, they are outstanding rehabs. We go above and beyond. And so when a client buys that, nine out of 10 times, they come back and buy more assets. We have clients that are in South Africa even that have bought six, seven assets, and they send us pictures and testimonials, and they just love those assets because they're extremely passive assets. Well, real estate is hot. You're also out there competing with other companies. There's obviously other turnkey providers. So what does it really take for you to get the inventory when a market is strong? You got to be creative. There's a lot of different things that we do to try to get inventory. There's a lot of wholesalers out there that have large markups on properties, which makes it really difficult for investors who are serious investors to purchase these properties. But, you know, we always go to the tax sale. We always go to the auctions anywhere we can to buy homes cash because that kind of sets us apart from a lot of people who can't buy cash. Maybe we're still on the MLS. We still have great relationships with a lot of different brokers. We have our own in-house broker, but there's a lot of tricks to the trade. One of the best ones really is if someone brings me a good deal and you're the agent on the deal, I'm going to let you know that I'm really not concerned with the commission, right? I don't need to take that commission. If the deal makes sense for me, I'll let somebody be my buyer's agent. And so that creates a little bit more deal flow coming our way where people are actually sending us more deals because they know that they're going to be able to act as our buyer's agent as well. If it's a good deal, it's a good deal. I want to try to get it. I'm not worried about a 3% commission. That's not my business. My business is the asset itself. That's a really interesting spin on how to acquire property. That really takes an abundant mindset to pull that off, and you've obviously been pulling it off. Carl Dean, you're quite an impressive real estate investor and entrepreneur, I must say. As we're kind of winding down here, any final thing that you want to leave Get Rich Education Nation with? Just invest wisely. There's a lot of good sources out there where you can look and try to find quality turnkey providers, but don't just go on sites like Craigslist and, and try to find someone selling a great deal. The strength in having a passive investment is all about the team you're investing with, a team that's going to stick with you for the long haul, not somebody who's going to sell you an asset and tell you good luck. It's all about your management team. It's all about the team, the aftercare, the people that you're going to be in contact with and, and them having your back is very important. So I know you got a link on your site that kind of shows some of our properties and gives a, an intro to some research I've done and some different things. I would just tell the listeners, definitely go check that stuff out. You know, do your due diligence and make sure that you're dealing with a company that is ethical. You know, be there for you in the long haul. That report that Carl is citing is at GetRichEducation.com slash Texas. Carl has a great video report rather than oftentimes you get a, a written report. Carl and I talked about giving you a video report because yeah, a lot of people just want to sit back and look at a nice video. And you talk a lot about Texas's market drivers and so on. Tell us a little bit more about that video. So that video has actually gotten a lot of great responses online. And it's, it's great. Basically, yeah, it goes into a very in-depth report showing why Texas? It's not just like, oh, these assets make sense and the numbers make sense. It's like, what is really driving this market, right? What makes me feel secure in investing in this market rather than just the home itself? And so I dive really deep into the Texas Enterprise Fund. I talk about all the different companies that have come here over the last decade, about people moving here. And I did the video because I wanted to actually show the statistics. I wanted to actually show the different forms and the different screenshots of the Texas Enterprise Fund so you could really see how aggressive Texas is being in getting local businesses or businesses from other states to move there. The market is more important than the property. Carl Dean, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for coming on to Get Rich Education. Thanks for having me, Keith. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man, Carl Dean crushing it today on GRE. 
You want to deal with a person that tells it like it is rather than just telling you what he thinks you want to hear every time. And that is refreshing and clarifying. And you can feel Carl's passion, knowledge, confidence, and even wisdom at his young age. Maybe only the second or third guest we've ever had on GRE that's younger than I. So when you talk about the durability of an income stream for an investor, well, People will demand an affordable place to live. And in Texas, you are buying in the path of progress when you buy right. Now, compared with other markets, when it comes to Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, and Houston, well, I have a history of owning turnkey property in Texas myself. And I think that you can actually find better cash flow in some markets outside of Texas. Yet in Texas, I would agree that it is often easier to get rent increases for yourself over time. Carl told us that the 1% rent to value ratio is getting tougher there. Well, as you build your turnkey portfolio, where you ideally own property in three, four, or five different turnkey metros, Texas might have one or two metros that fit into your portfolio. So Though your Texas turnkey might just might provide less monthly cash flow than in other markets, Some investors like to balance their turnkeys in other markets along with some Texas ones where they have a hope for better appreciation in Texas with appreciation and tax-free cash out refinances that you can take every few years along the way. You know, that way it's sort of like cash flow that you receive in a lump sum every few years rather than traditional monthly cash flow. Now, of course, hope for appreciation alone is not a strategy. We're still buying a property based on its monthly income, exceeding its monthly expenses primarily. Of course, that's how we can get a relatively lower risk with a high total rate of return. Special thanks today to the talented Carl Dean. You at least owe it to yourself to check out Carl, his company's resources, and his special report video for you at getricheducation.com slash Texas. For my developers, John Collins and Marcus Whelan, sound engineer Vidran Jampo, web designer Nikon Roy, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Though you might quit your day job, don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. real estate investors nationwide and worldwide, this is Get Rich Education's Keith Weinhold. Forbes has rated Memphis, Tennessee as the number one cash flowing market in the world. Our good friends at Mid-South Homebuyers have been Memphis's premier turnkey real estate provider for 14 years with a stellar reputation and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Owner Terry Kerr was born and raised in Memphis. Yeah, he knows the market and has renovated and sold over 1,000 houses in the Memphis area. Find out what their many repeat buyers already know. Their houses are completely renovated, even come with a one-year builder's warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're a perfect fit for the first-time out-of-state investor or the seasoned investor diversifying their portfolio. Mid-South Homebuyers Friendly Staff makes investing easy. Learn more at midsouthhomebuyers.com or give them a call at 901-217-HOME. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, getricheducation.com.